Hello and welcome to the I, your English news bulletin. I'm Esther. These are the headlines. The Nagaland Board of School Education has announced that the provisional results of the High School Leaving Certificate and Higher Secondary School Leaving Certificate Examination 2021 will be declared on the evening of July 20. The Union Home Ministry has requested the Central Bureau of Investigation to inquire into the case of the deaths of Samuel and Rosie Sangma. The government of Nagaland has directed every health worker in both public and private hospitals who have not been vaccinated to produce negative test certificates every 15 days. Now for the news in details. The Nagaland Board of School Education has announced that the provisional results of the high school leaving certificate and higher Secondary School Leaving Certificate Examination 2021 will be declared on the evening of July 20. Updates received here on Tuesday, July 14 stated. Chairperson of the NBC, NBSE, Asano Sekose, issued a press release stating that the results can be viewed and mark sheets downloaded online. Mark sheets in hand copy will be issued only later, the information about which will be given only later, the press release stated. The government of Nagaland has issued a notice directing every health worker in both public and private hospitals who have not been vaccinated to produce negative test certificates. The Department of Health and Family Welfare issued a notice on July 14 Wednesday stating the directive. In pursuance of the High Court's order dated June 30, 2021, passed in a public interest litigation, health authorities' notice stated all health workers in both the public and private hospitals who have not been vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccines are directed to produce COVID-19 negative test certificates by getting tested every 15 days as and when they report for duties to ensure the safety of patients, co-workers and the community. The chief medical officers or the medical superintendents of the districts are directed to ensure compliance of the order by all health workers, the notice stated. The district task force should also ensure that the private hospitals also follow the same directives the update stated. Likewise, the government has directed the health authorities to give priority of COVID-19 vaccination to shopkeepers and vegetable vendors. A separate notice from the Health and Family Welfare Department stated the notice was in pursuance of the High Court's order. Shopkeepers and vegetable vendors are vulnerable sections of the society and are not only at risk of contracting COVID-19 but are also potential spreader of the virus due to the nature of their profession. The department stated, therefore, priority for COVID-19 vaccination must be given to these particular sections of the community, it stated. The chief medical officers or medical superintendents of the districts are directed to take necessary steps to ensure fast-track vaccination of the mentioned sections of the community on priority, the notice stated. It has been confirmed that the Union Home Ministry has requested the Central Bureau of Investigation to inquire into the case of the deaths of Samuel and Rosie Sangma. The case relates to the death of Ms. Rosie Sangma in a hospital in Gurgaon on June 24 after she had complained of a medical condition. Later, Samuel Sangma, a relative of Rosie Sangma, suspecting medical negligence, had an altercation with doctors and staff of the hospital. Next day, on June 25, the Delhi police received information regarding the death of Samuel Sangma in New Delhi. The family of the deceased has alleged that Ms. Rosie Sangma had died due to negligence on part of the hospital. They also attributed some alleged foul play in the death of Samuel Sangma by the hospital staff. Further, Nagaland Chief Minister Nifurio in a tweet thanked Union Home Minister Amit Shah for ordering the CBI inquiry and hoped for a quick justice to be delivered. The Agriculture Technology Management Agency, or ATMA, conducted training programs during July 13 to the 14 to encourage the agriculture and allied services sector in Tuli, subdivision of Mokokchung district. 
The ATMA of Tuli Block conducted a series of activities to boost the agri and allied sector at Anaki Old and Marangkong villages respectively from July 13th to the 14th. In these two villages, training was conducted on advanced management practices on piggery besides inauguration of a farm school on bananas, mobilization of the United Food Security Group or FSG and demonstration on the performance of mid-duration of soya bean updates stated. The resource persons for the events were Dr. Tushiwati, Farm Manager, State Pig Breeding Centre at Marangkong, and Tamjin Sosang, Farm School Teacher. Dr. Tushiwati stressed on symptoms and identification of very common occurring diseases such as classical swine fever, African swine fever, and porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. Later, a farm school on banana was inaugurated. Farm school teacher Tam Jin So Sang shared his expertise on management practices of banana cultivation and encouraged the enrolled students to be more progressive in farming and never give up in achieving their goals. On July 14, Shilunok Dang Jamir of Tuli Block demonstrated the performance of mid duration soya bean in Marangkong village. The farmers were told about the introduction of the variety in the field for the first time in the block. The update stated, they were encouraged to continue working hard to uplift their livelihood, it was informed. More than 30 farmers participated in the series of activities. As part of its efforts to prepare for a third possible COVID-19 wave, nurses at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi are undergoing a three-day training program at the hospital's pediatric department. The rotational training program began on July 12 and was done in three batches over three days, sources told ANI. They added that training will be imparted to nurses from all wards of the hospital's COVID-19 department. Ames Delhi College of Nursing is coordinating the program. During the devastating second COVID-19 wave earlier this year, the country saw children getting affected, of which a few were severely affected. Pediatric departments of hospitals also reported post-COVID symptoms in children, especially MISC, for which hospitals had to pay special attention. A few weeks ago, a joint survey by the WHO and Ames found that zero prevalence was 55.7% in below 18 years of group and 63.5% in the 18 plus age group. A Lancet India task force had also earlier commissioned an advisory highlighting the planning, protocol and policy guidelines for pediatricians ahead of a likely third wave of COVID-19 that is speculated to impact children. The intensive care chapter of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics is also working on training 6,000 pediatricians to tackle adults also for the last six months. Along with this, pediatricians hailing from B-grade towns, C-grade towns and small villages are also being trained. In the past 24 hours, India reported 38,792 new COVID-19 cases, 41,000 recoveries and 624 deaths as per the Health Ministry. The United States has deep concerns about the military coup in Myanmar and called on Southeast Asian nations to take action and to end violence and restore democracy in the country. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on Wednesday. The Association of Southeast Nations, or the ASEAN, has been leading the main diplomatic effort on member country, Myanmar, since a February 1 coup plunged it into turmoil. During a video conference with Asian foreign ministers on Wednesday, Blinken urged Asian to take immediate action on a five-point consensus agreed upon in April to appoint a special envoy to Myanmar, State Department spokesperson Ned Price said in a statement. Myanmar has descended into chaos after the coup, with hundreds of protesters killed by security forces and thousands jailed amid paralyzing strikes and spreading conflict in border regions. Blinken asked for the release of all those unjustly detained in the country and the restoration of Myanmar's democratic transition, Price said. Blinken also emphasized the U.S. rejection of China's unlawful maritime claims in the South China Sea and said Washington stands with Southeast Asian claimants in the face of Chinese coercion, Price said. The CBI has registered an FIR against a senior superintendent in the regional passport office in Madurai, who was allegedly issuing Indian passports to foreign nationals, including Sri Lankans, brought by travel agents, officials said on Tuesday. He carried out searches at three locations in Madurai after booking Vira Putiran, senior superintendent, RPO Madurai, and other person identified as Ramesh in connection with the case, they said. The agency has alleged that in 
2019 and 20, Veeraputiran entered into a criminal conspiracy with Ramesh and other travel agents operating in Madurai, the official said. In pursuance of the conspiracy, Veeraputiran, while posted as granting officer at Passport Seva Kendra, Tirunelveli, fraudulently issued Indian passports to Sri Lankans and other ineligible people in return for pecuniary benefits from the travel agents, the CBIFIR allege. The agency has found that he had demanded and accepted an amount of rupees 45,000 from Ramesh, which was deposited in Viraputiran's savings account, it added. Kerala Governor Arif Mohammed Khan on Wednesday morning began a day-long fast at his official residence Raj Bhavan to raise awareness on the injustice of the practice of dowry and atrocities against women. The fast was scheduled from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Wednesday as per Raj Bhavan sources. This may be the first time in Kerala's history that a governor is fasting for such a social cause. The fasting protest campaign was initiated by various Gandhian organizations such as Gandhi, Smarakan Nidhi with the aim to create awareness against the practice of giving and taking dowry as part of marriage unions. At Gandhi Bhavan, several Gandhians are also observing the dawn to dust fast. The Gandhian organization said their program aims to end atrocities against women and to address the need to make Kerala a safer place. Khan will also attend a prayer meeting at the Gandhi Bhavan later in the evening before ending his fast. In a video message issued on Tuesday evening, Khan said that dowry is a grave injustice and ignominy to the dignity of women. Kerala was in the news recently for a tragic death due to dowry, he said. It is sad that this spectre of dowry continues to raise its ugly head in the state which has been globally acclaimed for its social indicators, including literacy and life expectancy, he said. Union Home Secretary Ajay Bhalla on Wednesday wrote a letter to chief secretaries and administrators of states and union territories directing them to continuously focus on the five-fold strategy for effective management of COVID-19, that is test, track, treat, vaccination and adherence to COVID-appropriate behaviour. Strict directions to the district and other local authorities to regulate the crowded places and take necessary measures for the management of COVID-19. Bala in his letter said that consequently an increase in the R factor or reproduction number in some of the states is a matter of concern. The letter pointed out that any increase in R factor above 1.0 is an indicator of the spread of COVID-19. Therefore, it is important that the authorities concerned shall be made responsible for ensuring COVID-appropriate behavior in all crowded places such as shops, malls, markets, market complexes, weekly markets, restaurants and bars, mandis, bus station, railway platform stations, public parks and gardens, gymnasiums, banquet halls, marriage halls, stadia, sports complexes if opened up by the state, as well as all the areas identified as hotspots for transmission of COVID-19 virus, Pala said in his letter to the state's union territories, said the Home Secretary in his letter. UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, is warning of a looming humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan as the escalating conflict brings increased human suffering and civilian displacement. Approximately 270,000 Afghans have been newly displaced inside the country since January 2021, primarily due to the insecurity and violence, bringing the total uprooted population to over 3.5 million, the UN said in a statement. Families forced to flee their homes in recent weeks cite the worsening security situation as the predominant reason for their flight, the statement added. Displaced civilians have told UNHCR and partners of incidents of extortion by non-state armed groups and the presence of improvised explosive devices on major roads. Many have reported interruptions to social services and a loss of income due to the rising insecurity. The number of civilian casualties has risen 29% during the first quarter of this year compared to 2020, according to UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan. An increasing proportion of women and children were among those targeted. The needs of those who have had to flee suddenly are acute, the UN agency said. UNHCR and partners, as part of a coordinated response, are assisting newly displaced Afghans with emergency shelter, food, health, water and sanitation support and cash assistance, despite challenges in accessing vulnerable groups, the UN agency said. 
The United Arab Emirates on Wednesday became the first Gulf state to open an embassy in Israel as its envoy hailed the trade and investment opportunities that closer ties would bring at a flag-raising ceremony also attended by Israel's president. By shared an ease about Iran, the UAE and Bahrain normalized relations with Israel last year under the Abraham Accords, crafted by the administration of then U.S. President Donald Trump. Sudan and Morocco have since also moved to establish ties with Israel. The opening of the UAE embassy, which is situated in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, followed the inauguration of Israel's embassy in the UAE last month. Since the normalization of ties, they have seen for the first time discussions on trade and investment opportunities, UAE Ambassador Mohammed Al Khaja said, after raising his country's flag outside the building. They are said to have signed major agreements across various fields, including economy, air travel, technology and culture. Israeli President Isaac Herzog called the opening of the embassy an important milestone in the journey towards the future, peace, prosperity and security for the Middle East. That's all for tonight's English News Bulletin. I'm Esther. Keep watching Hornbill TV.